Even in the worst catastrophe, there is something unknown and cherished to be discovered. We are certain that all life and death contain something cherished that can be observed. If we listen, if we look for its internal dynamic, watch its behavior, and commit to its being, we may discover it. Once we discover it, we can establish a relationship with it. Despite the distance maintained between the Barracuda and ourselves, we still have a relationship with it. That relationship is one of cherishing the distance between predator and prey. In this way, the Barracuda becomes a teacher, and the relationship is one of student and teacher. The space is deep green water. Hello and welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And Happy New Year, everybody. A little bit belated for reasons, but Happy New Year indeed. Happy New Year. And happy birthday to us. I know. It's been a whole year. I can't believe it. We've done a whole year of podcasting. It's amazing. And so many books. I loved putting the books together on the shelf and taking pictures of them because it's kind of amazing. It's like this pile of treasures. If you lined up end to end every episode we put out, including all the bonus episodes, it would be well over a day of us <laughs> yammering away. <laughs> So let's let's look forward to another another day this year. And also, I think it's been so interesting for us thinking about the year and also thinking about how this year might be different. In other words, what have we learned and what are the kinds of things we feel like where we might take different paths? That's, I think, very exciting. Yeah. And on that note, uh, we would love it if any of you listeners would write in and mm. tell us what you think, things that you particularly like that we do and things that you think we could do differently ways that we might structure things differently, or, you know, if you get lost while listening to us, if you want to hear more reading, if you want to hear less reading, I don't know, whatever, whatever you're thinking, we would love to hear a little bit of feedback at this point. Mm -hmm. And also books you'd really like to hear about, or books you might even like us to revisit in a different kind of way. I mean, that's something we're open to as well. Yeah, or topic clusters. I mean, no guarantees about anything, but we would definitely <laughs> love to hear what you're interested in. And which ones you like the most? That's actually really helpful for us, too, I think, in thinking about the future. <laughs> yeah, we always like that. Yeah, we'll know what worked and what didn't. Yeah, yeah. Just just keep talking. We'd love to hear from you. Now, big news on that front. Another thing, another thing we should tell you about. Uh, the Spouter Inn has been nominated for a 2020 Canadian Podcast Award. Yay! It's crazy. So <laughs> if you are Canadian and you make podcasts, then you're eligible to vote for us. So please do in the Outstanding Arts Series category. And you can also maybe vote for our friends over at This Is Your Mixtape, who have been nominated for an Outstanding Music Series. Yay! Yeah. And so voting closes on February 18th, and you have to join and prove that you're a Canadian podcaster in order to vote. It's not that hard, but go to awards.podcamptoronto.com and vote, vote, vote. We'll have a link in the show notes. And while you're there, you should discover some new Canadian podcasts along the way. Yes, vote early and often. <laughs> exactly. Ah, so we also thought... Uh, with our new year, we might take a little time to try something different. We tried something different at the end of the year by looking back and remembering somebody who had passed that year. And we're going to try something a little bit different in the beginning of the year and read a book that's going to bring in new voices and new ways of thinking to our diet. Yeah, I thought this is a really neat thing that we decided to do, to do a sort of a, instead of a cluster, a single episode at the end of the year and a single episode at the beginning of the year, kind of looking back, looking forward, giving us a chance to take stock of the bigger themes that we've been thinking about, like what is literature, what is canonicity, what's the role of voice, what's the role of reading, what's the role of written text. I think this is going to be a book that's going to let us think through some of those issues, or at least to begin to think through them. So uh, we've decided to read Lee Maracle's Memory serves. Yeah. It's really, uh, really interesting and odd book. You know, often one of the things we end up doing when we start our discussion is we talk about what the genre of a book is, right? I mean, like, where does it fit into the categories that we're accustomed to thinking about? And this book fits very oddly, I always think. Like, on the one hand, you could sort of see it as a collection of essays. It's nonfiction, right? But it has fictional moments. And it's essays, but Essays of a very different kind, especially the opening one and the last two, they're a kind of a combination of different perspectives in time, different modes of writing. And they're talking about different ways of thinking about story or what you might call literature or what you might even call like word art. Um, so it's a, it's a book that inhabits a whole bunch of in-between spaces. 
Now, you have worked a bit with the author, Lee Miracle. Why don't you tell us a little bit about her and a little bit about what you've done with her? Yeah. Well, uh, let me start by talking about her. Uh, Lee Miracle is, uh, comes from the Stolo people, part of the Pacific Coast Salish Nation. And Stolo means river. So the Pacific Coast Salish, you know, sort of are people of sort of the, the ocean territories, but the distinction of the Stolo is that they're, they're of the river. And this is a, informs in all kinds of really interesting ways the stories that they tell about themselves and about their histories, um, which I think that's interesting. So Lee Miracle is a granddaughter of Chief Dan George, um, who was really important in political terms, but also an actor, a poet, a musician. Um, and so that's some of the people she comes from. Uh, if you ask her who she is, I mean, I think she'll say she's a mother, a grandmother, an elder, an advisor, a teacher, and she's an author in many different genres. She writes fiction and nonfiction. Um, she said of herself, I am the most published Native woman author in the country. And that's a really important statement because that's something she earned, she made happen. You know, when Indigenous writers were getting some attention but really struggling to be visible, especially in the 70s, she's somebody who was very active in making space for her own voice and for other Indigenous writers. Um, so she just inhabits a really important place in that landscape. Of her novels and short fiction, probably some of the best known are Raven Song, a novel that came out in 1993, and a more recent kind of sequel to that called Celia's Song that came out in 2014. And um, she's written also quite a lot of nonfiction, Memory Serves, that we'll be talking about today. And she had a book in 1988 called I Am Woman that also had a really powerful impact um, in terms of really staking out a position from the perspective of indigenous feminism. All right, so that's indigenous feminism in the Turtle Island First Nations Canadian context, but also more broadly thinking about indigenous feminisms. Um, so that's a, been a really influential book. Um, she, but she writes all different kinds of things, drama, poetry, different kinds of performance, and oratory. And this is something we'll talk about at length, oratory. That's a term that, uh, you know, those of us more familiar with European and North American modes of thought, like we may think we know what oratory is, but the ways in which she talks about oratory are really different, really provocative, I think. Um, and so it'll be neat to get to that. So tell us a little bit about the work that you've done with Lee Miracle. So I got to know her a couple of years ago in the course of putting together some workshops that were on pedagogy, so on modes of teaching. And the focus in those, I don't want to go into detail about it, but the focus on those turned to indigenous pedagogy, indigenous modes of knowing. And so she was very generous with her time with me and with a handful of other people at the University of Toronto who wanted to sort of develop those conversations. And it was a really extraordinary experience to to sit with her in her office at First Nations House and to to talk through and think through the planning and the kind of reflection that was necessary to get ready for these workshops. It was a very different mode of being and it was kind of uh, enacting some of the modes of thinking and learning and conversing that she actually talks about in Memory Serves. And I only kind of put that together over time, you know, realizing that what had been going on in that room was in some ways uh, coming to life of the kinds of things that are described um, in the book. And so that was really neat. And um, beyond that, I had read a part of Memory Serves for the first time when those conversations began. We had our first meeting with her, you know, again, a couple of years ago, and she had suggested in the wake of that uh, reading her oratory on oratory, which is the closing essay of Memory Serve. So I read that very early on. So this is a book that I've re read and reread, either in part or in whole, many times. But in spite of that, getting ready for um, you know our conversation today, I found myself just still seeing things that I hadn't seen before and understanding things and getting stuck on things. You know, like it's a book that. Like I, I get something very different out of every time. So again, that's an unusual experience to have. If you've been reading for as long as I have, like it's an unusual experience to have. Um, so that's been very neat. Yeah, you had recommended that I read Oratory on Oratory around the time that you first encountered it, I believe. Yeah, because my mind was blown. Yes. <laughs> it probably told a lot of people to read it. It was, we, I was really working through that for some period of time. So, so I've read it a few times now as well. And that essay in particular is a very thick essay with lots of ideas in it. Although there's plenty of ideas throughout the entire book, which makes sense, not only because she's a very smart, thoughtful person, mm -hmm. uh, but also because this is a collection of oratories, and we'll explain that term eventually. But this is a collection of oratories that she had given out over 20 years, sort of halfway between essays and 
lectures, those are not adequate, but, but that's a starting point maybe of how to think about this. So this is a collection of, of decades of thought and brought together and, and then edited to try to make it into a cohesive book. Uh, but you know, of course it's going to be rich and thick and full of details that are going to that are going to pop up every time and, and, and make you stumble and make you think in new ways. Yeah. But it's, it, it's so fascinating, even as you describe that, you know, it's so different from what we would conventionally expect. Like you were saying, oh, these are um, spoken word or these are oratory. These are spoken, not lectures, but, you know, things that are spoken that then were edited into a book form. But that's a kind of a tremendous understatement um, in describing what this is. This is um, uh, the the editorial process wasn't just sort of like recording these spoken things and like editing them into a tidy form. It was actually this collaboration with um, Smaro Cambarelli, and it's described in the um, afterward to the volume, where they really just work together over a long period of time and sort of, I guess you could almost say translating oratory into written form, making it into a written form that would mirror or would stand in the place of or would provide an entryway to the oral oratory, right? So it's, it's, it's a really, I mean, for, I mean, I, I know it sounds a little fangirlish, right? But it's like, for me, it really <laughs> blows my mind because a very different way of thinking about the relationship of oral and written in literature. We've talked about this a lot. Like we take pains to read aloud from the books that we're discussing and to sort of give voice to, to remind readers that it's not just words on a page that you see, it's, it's voice, it's embodied in some way. This is a very different way of thinking about that relationship and it kind of blows my mind. Yeah. From the description at the end of the book of the process, it really seemed like they were trying to forge a new genre. Yeah. Written oratory mm -hmm. that would be distinct from what was, you know, a, a bare transcript of what was said mm -hmm. and also distinct from what an essay would be like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It will be interesting. I'm sure someday we will get around to doing Montaigne's essays. I do want to do that. Where he's also trying to stake out this form that would become the essay that you and I are most familiar with. And it'll be interesting to see that kind of reaching for genre and to think about if we see any connections between those two uh, writers. Definitely. So before we go any further, I do want to say that these ideas are not ideas that I am expert in, and they are not ideas that belong to me. Mm -hmm. That we are presenting our reactions to them and the thoughts that they're sparking in us, and we're going to be, try to be honest in that. Mm -hmm. But I strongly encourage any listeners who are intrigued by this or want to find out more about this, or even if you don't, maybe you should do this anyways, to go and read the books, mm -hmm. especially if you are living in Canada, because the book is coming largely from a position of peoples who are living in what is now Canada. So some of the language, some of the ideas have been developed in different ways in the United States and amongst Indigenous people elsewhere, I assume are different, but I don't know. I'm not an expert. Yeah, you know, I think maybe a really good way of framing the conversation we're having, and you were at one of those workshops that Lee Miracle and a few others of us had organized last last couple of years, where um, the discussion as it was as it would proceed around the circle, people would respond to what they'd heard and often respond with the words, you know, when I hear you speak, it strikes me that, or I'm struck by, you know, in other words, that what you're giving is not a critique or a question or, you know, pushing what the other person has said into a different direction, but rather what, what is your response? What, what comes from you? And that's kind of what we're doing in a way, right? This is what comes from us when we read this book. And, you know, we kind of offer it up to the people who are listening to us and see where it goes. Um, and like you said, the book is incredibly rich and I really encourage our listeners to, to take a look at it. You know, actually on that note, I was at that uh, mm -hmm. event, as you said, and uh, I was incredibly struck mm -hmm. by that formulation where you would respond to something that someone had put out there, so to speak, by saying, I was struck by how that was the ideal way to begin your response. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a, a bit of a mind blown moment for me as well. Like it was such a new technique for how you would engage with something in that way or how you would respond to something, I guess, is to just talk about how it struck you. And I, and I feel like that has informed some of the ways that I've approached some of the books that we've talked about on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, wow. That in certain circumstances, I have found it best to just think about what struck me about this mm -hmm. and move from there rather than, you know, 
trying to express mastery of it or trying mm-hmm. to push mm-hmm. back against it or try to argue it into a corner or anything like that. Just say, well, here's what struck me. Mm-hmm. I think it's a really lovely way of thinking. Well, it's a respectful way of approaching what you're hearing from someone else or of responding to the book that you read, right? Because it's not, like you said, it's not trying to express mastery. It's not trying to kind of inhabit the knower's position, right? It's you're, you're giving back, you know, and it's a generous way of reading and listening, uh, which I think is awesome. Right? It's, it's changed the way I think about a lot of things too. So I think we need to actually try to explain to listeners who have not heard the term before, what exactly oratory is. Yeah. I mean, one way of defining it would be to describe it as spoken language that affects the listener. For many of us, I think when we think of the term oratory, we tend to situate it in the context of antiquity or religious experience. So antiquity, Cicero, you know, other kinds of, you know, ancient Roman writers who, you know, taught how to do oratory correctly. So we understand it as a kind of a performance. Often, potentially kind of deceptive, you know, a way you speak aloud to make people do things. Or we think about it in the context um, of the preaching tradition, right? Oratory being something you do to kind of stir people up emotionally and to push them in a particular direction. But oratory, as it's formulated here in Miracle's writing, inhabits a very different space. Um, She defines it many times and in many slightly different kinds of ways. Um, And it's hard to know which one to begin with. One of the things she says about speaking and, you know, the performance of oratory is its meaning comes into being like in the response of the people there. In other words, um, it's not that the person who's speaking compels those who are listening to a certain course of action, but rather those who listen also listen with care and respond to what they're hearing and add on to what they're hearing um, and are stirred to move in new directions by it. So it's kind of collaborative, I guess you would say, or accretive. Yeah, one of the things that she describes is that if she's beginning an oratory, one of the first things she has to do is, so to speak, read the room. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. not in a way that is manipulative, again. Mm -hmm. It's it's just where is the audience and how can I connect with them? Mm -hmm. How can how can I make this meaningful for them? How can I make this, you know, something that will attach to their lives? But it goes beyond that. Yeah. One of the things she does is to make it really clear how capacious oratory is. I mean, it's fundamentally spoken word, right? And she says this. She says, our oratory covered all areas of knowledge, history, sociology, political science, medical knowledge, aquaculture and horticulture, law, science, as well as stories. So it's basically a knowledge system, right? It's a way of managing a whole range of kinds of knowledge that is held communally, right? That's held by the community collectively, right? So it's all these things as well as stories. Stories, however, she says, are much more fun, seemingly innocuous, less harmful, and much more entertaining than science or medicine. Stories do not indicate the sort of knowledge attached to genius, at least not in quite the way that science and medicine do in Western society. So to some degree, stories survive the virulence of colonial attack. Right. So story is something that on the one hand is recognizable sort of from a Eurocentric perspective, right? Like it, it's analogous to, it's related to literature. And she says to include oratory as novel in the world of literature doesn't detract from Western definitions, right? We can juxtapose those, but it's inhabiting a very different kind of space. It's not exactly the same thing as literature. Think about literature. What do we mean when we say literature, right? It's litera, right? It's letters. And so the status of written text is always there, right? It's always, even if it's not currently written down, right? We're always, we've always got that written paradigm underlying, even if we talk about like oral literatures, right? You know, or oral formulaic, whatever stuff, right? Right. We understand them to be transcribable. Yeah. We're always thinking about either it's come from a written text or it's going to become a written text, right? This this is this is reflexive, right, in the Western tradition, right? We always think about this. Um, but this model of thinking about oratory and story within the world of oratory is very different because the spoken quality is primary. So it's precisely not literature. It can become written down, but that's not its fundamental essence at all. Well, there's sort of a, a, a two-sided coin about this where you've got You've got the spoken moment of oratory, but you've also got the memory moment of it. And there are some interesting descriptions of memory throughout the book, especially in the first essay, where you understand that memory is something that is more than just 
remembering, so to speak. But it's this really, she says, listening, which is the precursor to memory, listening is an emotional, spiritual, and physical act. Like it's when she's going to remember something, when she's engaging in that mode, it's, it's a full body experience. Mm -hmm, it is, mm -hmm. it is absolutely something that you need training in. Mm -hmm. You need to be recognized by your peers as good as, mm -hmm. and it's something that is vital to the continuation of oratory because it, you know, to have this kind of spoken method of maintaining knowledge, you need people to be able to remember it so that it can be accurately spoken again, even if it's changed from one speaker to another and from one occasion of speaking to another. You need somebody who can remember it well to maintain that line of oratory over countless generations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you brought out so many important points there, right? Because oratory, as you say, like the first thing you do is you read the room. In other words, the way it's going to be delivered is going to vary every time according to who's there and what they need to hear and what they need to hear at that particular moment and where you all are at the moment that the oratory takes place, right? So it's conditioned by this. So as opposed to, again, this sort of Eurocentric idea of like poetic creation or literary creation, we have this idea of like, you know, the you know genius author right this is a very different model that presumes the existence of story that's communally held collectively held and then is given voice in oratory in a particular place in a particular time with particular people and the listeners right and you're bringing this out it's again it's not this sort of you know, Western tradition that we tend to have where we think about memory as something like, oh, either you have a good memory or a bad memory, right? Some people remember stuff, some people don't. Or you can memorize things where you try to capture something word for word, like if you're studying for a test or something, right? This is a very different notion of hearing and remembering that, like you said, is full body. She says this um, at one point, she says, it takes a huge emotional commitment to listen, to sort, to imagine the intent, to evaluate, to process and to seek the connection to the words offered so that remembering can be fair and just. That's such an interesting phrase, right? Fair and just. As opposed to saying, like, memorize it perfectly or give it back word for word. That's not what's being talked about here. No. There's a really great story that Lee Miracle shares with the editor of the book, Smaro Cambrelli, about a story her grandfather told her when she was a child. Quote, when he finished his telling, he said, now you tell it back to me different, but the same. And that idea that it's going to be different because it's somebody else telling it, it's with a different audience, it's a different moment, but it's the same. There is something fair and just about the way that this is being told again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really remarkable way of thinking about, you know, what is that story? What is that truth that's being passed back and forth between the grandfather and the granddaughter. Yeah, and she doesn't use that word truth, right? No, she doesn't. I, that might not be an appropriate word for that, but, yeah. uh, you, but I, I hope you can get what I'm sort of grasping at. You know, but it's a neat point, right? Like, in other words, that that's not what's relevant there, right? What's relevant is that it's faithful to what it's, I mean, or, or careful, right? She uses that word elsewhere where she says, rememberers attend to the words spoken with care so that the oratory can be repeated later. And repeated there, again, it's doing a really interesting kind of work. It's not that it's going to be a word for word repetition, right? It's going to be a kind of almost recreation, a restorying. So this is how stories get told back and forth. This is how stories get told over generations. But of course, as you said, it, it's not just stories. It's it's all areas of knowledge. It's everything, as you said, history, sociology, political science, etc. You've got all of these things that can be held and transmitted through these acts of remembering and retelling. Yeah. And story, how can I put it? Story isn't all separate from these other modes of knowledge, right? It's intimately bound up with them and it gets transformed over time. Pretty close to the end of the book. I'm not sure if it's in the last essay or the second to last essay. She talks about transformation. Do you remember that? Oh, I think yes. it's in the second to last essay. Um, she says, we are transformers. We arrive through transformation and our stories are documents of the historical transformations we've experienced. We are expected to carry on the tradition of continuous transformation by recreating new stories that are connected to our history of story and transformation. We are expected to live our lives as story. We breathe story, tell and retell story. We alter our being over and over again throughout our lives based on the creation and recreation of story. The stories we tell address the transformations we have and have not made in our own lives. 
It's such a neat passage, right? Because it's quite repetitive, right? Transformation and transforming, transformation, transformers. Those words appear over and over again in those sentences. And they're precisely about, right? It's the same word, but it's doing something different every time, right? Um, so story is the way that we have a kind of continuity, right? It gives us a thread that connects us to what's in the past. What's our history, right? Um, story is what brings that alive over and over again. So like in that anecdote um, with her grandfather that you quoted a few minutes ago, you're always retelling it different but the same. And that's why the role of the listener is so important, right? And you have to learn to do it and be good at it and be mindful of it and listen with your whole body, right? Because it's not that you have to simply reproduce what you've heard word for word. It's actually harder than that because you have to reproduce how you heard it and what the connotations were and everything that was in it so that when you render it again, you're, you're, you're faithful to it, right? You're, you're doing that well. Um, and you're bringing everybody who's with you, everyone around you into sort of a space of new knowledge that's still connected to the knowledge from before. That's, a, as you, I think, incredibly interesting way of thinking about how story can be interpretive. Like, again, in this like Eurocentric tradition, we're like, oh, story is the thing you interpret, right? You put it on the table, you dissect it, you describe what genre it's in. Here's the beginning, the middle, and the end. You know, here are its literary feature. You know, you know the routine, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is a totally different notion of what story could be for. Well, and there's also the sense that helps distinguish it from the modes of oratory that we talked about, the Eurocentric modes of oratory of, of political and, and religious speech, mm -hmm. the persuasive speech in that sense. Because this kind of oratory, she stresses, needs the community as one of the legs. It's not just the speaker and the listeners, but it's a speaker who is connected to the community and, and you know, the, the long community going back countless generations. And and then moving it forward yet another step, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That seems very different from what the political, I mean, it's very different from political oratory. Oh, yeah. It's because it's fully participatory, right? I mean, at one point early on um, in the book, she she's talking about, you know, um, oral societies. And she says, in oral societies, memory is complex. She says, first and foremost, remembering requires that human beings assign themselves the task of observing, selecting, and committing to memory certain phenomena. It also requires that the rememberer possess the acumen, skill, and training for recollection. It is critical that the human recalling an event possesses recall with a high degree of accuracy, and this is the interesting part, that the faculty of the rememberer is recognized and honored by his or her community. Right. So there's something really interesting going on there with remembering, right? It's not just passive listening and remembering, right? It's participatory with the expectation that it'll be generative going forward. And it's communal, right? It's not just like there's this one person who's delivering oratory and everybody else kind of just receives it passively. Something else is going on here, this active listening, which is, again, something I don't think we're really accustomed to thinking about. By, by we, I mean, you know, quite you subtle I. people. I don't think we're accustomed <laughs> to thinking about this. Right. So it's incredibly interesting to, 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 to begin to try to enter into this, this way of thinking. So one of the reasons why I think this is particularly interesting for us to do is to think about the the challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the right word, but maybe. Mm, the qu questions, the provocations, yeah. That oratory poses to our sense of literature. Uh -huh. Oratory is, generally speaking, not a stable, written down object for you know later reading and dissection, which mm -hmm. is sort of like what we normally do. Mm -hmm. But you know, it, but it is literary. Like it, it absolutely counts. I think, and it's it's word art, right? It's language art, right? Yeah, yeah. It is absolutely a thing that if we encountered it we would recognize as being part of it or related to it or however you learn, however it wants to, or however they want it to be connected. She, she frames it in a few different ways over the course of the book, whether oratory is or is not part of literature as understood from a Eurocentric perspective. But I think ultimately she seems to think that it's fine <laughs> as in that role. But of course it's, 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 bringing very different assumptions and very different modes of transmission. And it's it, it's doing things that we couldn't easily 
uh, capture. That's a, that's a terrible word. Yeah, yeah, no, that's icky. But it but it is sort of what we do, right? Like even even in texts that we've looked at within the European tradition, right? Mm-hmm. Like we had to decide which version of Frankenstein we were going to comment upon because obviously Frankenstein was sort of a living text when Mary Shelley was living. You know, she changed it, it changed, and Leaves of Grass even mm-hmm. more so. That's true, you're right. And and but we said this is the version that we're going to capture, so to speak, and mm-hmm. talk about because we're not going to absorb the entirety of the tradition and because we wanted a firm text to look at. But, you know, we did, though, and I think this was a good thing looking back on it, we did kind of acknowledge that, not that we were doing something totally arbitrary, but that we were choosing. We're like, okay, we're going to choose for Frank and we're going to choose this version and not this version. Or it leaves the grass, we're going to look at these poems, you know, this iteration of the collection and, and not this one. And others, we were thinking about the occasion. Remember we were talking about oratory a few minutes ago as being situated in a particular place at a particular time with particular people in the room or in the space or on that land, you know. Um, so there's a kind of sense of an occasion, like it's, it's, a, it's a moment that you're identifying, right, where things are kind of crystallized. And that's a little bit like, in some ways, like what we were doing. We're saying, okay, this is the the moment we're going to look at, right? Um, but even so, we were always thinking about, you know, who's the author, you know, auth- the un the author, you know, capital A, right? <laughs> you know, and yeah. you know what circumstances of their the, of their lives led them to create this thing. And some of the a lot of the works we were reading were very self conscious about this idea of creation, like you you know this go- godlike quality, right, of the author who makes a thing, right. And this is especially the case when we're talking about canonical literature, right? That's got this kind of aura associated with it. And oratory and especially story and oratory is being understood in a very different way where there's a continuity with the past, right? Of all the times the story has happened. And then the story is, you know, restoried, is storied up, right? Is retold different but the same in every one of these iterations. It's a very different way of thinking about um, what we usually talk about as literature, Right? So that, that's one of the ways this book is like, I think, so provocative, right? Because it, it kind of pushes us to say, well, what were we doing? Uh, what What is it we do when we pick out something we're going to talk about, a book we're going to talk about, or work we're going to talk about? Yes, that and, and, and what is out there that we'll never be able to pick by the nature of what it is. Yeah, that will always be inaccessible. Yeah, exactly. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not that we, it, it, it's not as if we need to be able to grab everything and we need to be able to talk about everything no we don't have time <laughs> but, <laughs> but also we don't need to right there's there there is something about these works that have that have somehow escaped their contexts that we can still appreciate on our terms i think that's sort of what we tend to do is look for works that maybe were created in one context but are still meaningful still engaging still compelling for us to read mm-hmm. even if that's not at all in the context, even if we don't understand, even if we don't fully understand the context in which they were originally written. Yeah. You know, I mean, think, I'm thinking a little bit about something you said a few moments ago about, um, you know, we choose things we might talk, you know, works we might talk about. Um, but I'm so increasingly aware that kind of this is the part of the iceberg that's above the waterline. You know what I mean? There's so much, not just that we won't have time to read, but like that is kind of unknowable and, and, or, or, that that we will not know, we will not get to, we will not hear or see or read, right? And so thinking about that and how that fact inflects the choices we make of what we talk about together, you know, in these episodes and so on, um, you know, what it means to choose things that are canonical or important or, you know, like, what are we doing in those moments? <laughs> now, now, you know, just think about, I mean, I know we've been reflecting on this all along, but it's really neat to think about. Like, there's a value in choosing books at least some of the time that uh, a lot of our listeners have read or at least know about, right? Because it gives us a common point of reference. It gives us an imaginative space to inhabit together. We have a common point of reference. But if you do that all the time, you're just relentlessly reproducing the same boring and kind of repressive canonicity, right? Canon formation that I think a lot of us are aware is, is a straitjacket, right? Yeah. No matter how much you critique its position, yeah. if you're only engaging with yeah. those works. You're just doing it again. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why we have We're it. not doing that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but we do it. We're, 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 but at the same time, it gives, it does 
it, if you do it in a limited kind of way, it gives you a backbone. It gives you like virtual spaces, I think. This is something, again, that, you know, we were saying earlier, we'd really like to hear from listeners. This is something that we, we are really trying to figure out, you and me. Um, and it'd be great to have help thinking that through. I think the other thing is to recognize that there's a tension, right, between this is you and I talking to our listeners, who some of whom we know, many of whom we don't. Mm -hmm. But we're picking the books that are canonical to us that we are still excited to engage with, or we're picking books that we that are less obviously canonical, but are somehow you know still in someone's canon that we are excited to look at, or they feel like they're part of the conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're we're doing that as two people, mm -hmm. and that can't reflect all the canons and it can't reflect all the literary works of merit let's say uh -huh, uh -huh, like uh -huh. that can't be we're not that capacious as two no. individuals <laughs> we do not contain all the multitudes sadly <laughs> exactly and that's and that's fine but it's really tricky to to present that mm -hmm. to want to sort of acknowledge the the great you know the bottom of the iceberg that we'll never know about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and to acknowledge our positions while also recognizing that, you know, our positions are fairly privileged and mm -hmm. people listening to this might be swayed, you know, to pick up Moby Dick, mm -hmm. which they totally should if they want to. Absolutely. But, but we want to include more that's under the iceberg mm -hmm. than we can. No, it was, it's something we're reaching toward, right? And I mean, you know, we were talking at the beginning about, you know, being at the end of our first year and looking back on what we've done and looking forward to what we might do. I mean, I'm really happy about a lot of what we've done, but the thing I'm kind of dissatisfied by and it makes me like yearn to do something different is, you know, we're two people, we have different interests, different tastes, and I think we're both interested in a lot of different things. But what I'm aware of is how limited we are. And, and that's good, right? That means if we've gotten to a place where at least for me, speaking for myself, a year later, I'm like, wow, we're so limited, right? And that tells you that we've, I think, speaking, and speaking for myself, feel like I've learned something, right? Um, so the question is, how do you push a little bit farther? How do we get ourselves into other kinds of spaces? But while also, I, this is the thing I'm getting at, like, while recognizing that we are limited, like, yeah. and that I, I feel like there's a really strong impulse for people to want to cover the entire <laughs> to be experts in world literature in the sense of like all the literatures of all the world. And, yeah. all the, yeah. and like, not only is that impossible, but it's arrogant. And I don't mm. want to be that level of arrogant. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, it, I just serendipitously, I just picked up a passage um, that comes from uh, Memory Serves that I think is a really good response to what we're talking about. Um, Lee Miracle says this. She's, she's talking about um, First Nations authors, um, Indigenous writers. She says, at the same time, critics, instructors, and institutions must respect that the picture First Nations authors advance is true, even if they don't see it that way, that it is half the colonial picture, that what you see may be true, but it is not what we see. It may be the other half of the picture. The moment we share a commonly constructed picture, a story, then we can begin to pull at the fabric holding the picture together, see its construction, and dismantle and recreate the design. Only then can we collectively recreate a community more human than before. This is the business of study in its totality for us. Right? This question of like creating a commonly constructed picture, like we're totally not there yet, right? But this is the thing to to look toward, right? This is the the goal to get toward. Right, um, and the, and the commonly constructed picture, I think, is you know, story and literature. One of the ways you get there. Yeah, and also talking with people, and you know, hopefully, the people that we've brought on as guests have helped us do that. I mean, I feel yeah. like they have. Oh yeah. And and I hope to, I hope we are able to get uh, an even wider and interestingly diverse collection of people to to gently push us to, into mm -hmm. seeing the the pictures that we're not seeing to that we can that we can better see mm -hmm. that we can better create those commonly constructed pictures. Yeah, like one of the things we've been doing actually this has been on my mind, you know, is we've been having people in to do bonus episodes, not as an afterthought exactly, but like we do a book and they'd be like, "Oh, who who might be interested in talking about this?" Another way of doing that would be to think about, you know, people we might like to do an episode with and get them to choose a book and then you know sort of do that backward, construct it backward. And that would put us in a place, you know, that would encourage us to see parts of the iceberg that we would not ourselves have found. Yeah, I mean, we've done a little bit of that, but it would be great to do more. I'm I'm excited about that. Yeah. 
I'm also excited about that because, of course, we're having conversations and we're re- even finding time to read books outside of the podcast. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of that going on that hopefully informs us that isn't going to be heard even by the most diligent listeners <laughs> who listen to every single thing we put out, who've got, you know, who, who go back and listen again and again. Yeah. You know, I want to come back to something that you were talking about a little bit earlier when you were talking, I can't remember the exact context, you were talking about truth, you know, when one's listening, you know, being a good listener and, you know, a well-trained listener, a listener who's doing the kind of listening they should do, listening with their whole body, being that, you know, truth is the goal. It's It was so, when you said that, it's so interesting to me to think about how I think Lee Miracle doesn't use that word. And like, that's not a way of correcting you. That's just a way of saying, isn't it interesting that she doesn't use that word? And I'm kind of fascinated by this. The phrase she uses and it comes up a number of times in here, and I've heard her use it in speaking as well, is what is cherished and hidden. So for example, if you're talking about a gathering of people, let's say in a circle, who are seeking to get to some sort of solution, a decision, just to get to some level of knowledge they don't have before. There's a kind of an iterative process of, you know, going around each person sort of responding, describing how they respond to, how they're struck by what's come before, right? Getting to some goal, right? Some um, some goal. And the language that gets used to describe it is what is cherished and hidden. And I remember being like always for a long time kind of puzzled by that. Like I kind of understood what was being described there. It's like what we might call an object of knowledge, right? And hidden. Like I totally got that, right? Because, you know, it's it's knowledge that's there in some sense and, and you just have to get to it. It's almost an allegorical way of thinking about knowledge, right? So I, I get that. But that it's cherished, right? And often we talk about something we cherished. We think about, I don't know, the way you are to a loved one, um, uh, a child, or a very beloved person, or a pet, or whatever, right? That's cherished, right? How can knowledge have that kind of status? Um, so it's a very different way of thinking about, you know, something that we might otherwise use the word truth for. It's, it's very different, I think. I was so struck by that. I thought that was so interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I did a, um, I did a quick search through the ebook and you're right that she doesn't use truth in the way that I used it there. Um, although the one way that she does use it is in a quote that I absolutely loved from it, which is hard truths require soft language. Mm. She says that at another point, if you have hard things to say, let your language tread softly. Yeah. She uses that phrase a few times. It's a good phrase. Wonderful. And it's changed each time, which is sort of, you know, mm-hmm. the, the thing mm-hmm. we're talking about here. That's um, right. But I, you know, I hope that, I hope that we've, uh, I'm not sure we let our language tread softly in this episode as much as we should have, but you know, we're learning. I feel I need to reiterate what we said a little while ago, which is that you should read these books. (laughs) You should not take our word Mm -hmm. for anything. Mm -hmm. This is, this is what struck us and how it's lodged in our heads right now. Um, but you should definitely explore this literature. Yeah. And with Lee Miracle's work in particular, another one of her books that came out um, actually quite recently is My Conversations with Canadians. And that's also, I think, a really terrific book. And there, it's that's a very different kind of book. It's explicitly sort of talking about the political and social situation north of the border and the whole question of, um, you know, who are we separately and together, to use the title of one of the essays in that book. So that's, how can I put that's a... It's a. I want to say it's a more conventional set of essays in the sense that it's essays written as essays. Like it's not. It's the form is going to be familiar to readers who may not know Lee Miracle's work already. Memory serves as a much, much more challenging book in the sense that not not more politically challenging because my conversations with Canadians is quite politically challenging and socially challenging, but memory serves as challenging because it invites you to to read and think and respond in a way that is really different. Um, from what I think most of our listeners are going to be accustomed to, especially the opening chapter, Memory Serves, and the last two chapters, um, which are called Dancing My Way to Orality, and finally the Oratory on Oratory. Um, they're, they're just doing something very different in formal ways. And they're not easy, but they're incredibly rich and layered. I mean, the analogy I would make, you know, you're talking about oratory on oratory being kind of, I don't know if you use the word dense, like it, that it was, that there was a lot, like it was difficult to take in. It's different from poetry, but it's like some poetry I've read where, where you have to read it over and over again. And the form is so much a part of the meaning and the effect on you is so much a part of the meaning. Like the meaning isn't just contained in the words on the page in the way that a more conventional essay might do. 
Um, so it's really worth it. But if um, our listeners, you know, try it and they find it a little hard, maybe going to my conversations with Canadians, um, that, that's a way into maybe her writing that um, then could get you to the very capacious and very challenging um, parts of Memory Serves. And also, you know, there's another thing you were saying, you know, you were saying, you know, you're reminded of how, how, you know, we're not experts in Indigenous writing or Indigenous modes of knowing. Like, like I said, I'm, I'm just beginning to be aware of how little I know, right? That That's a step on the path, right? But she, she talks about this, this incredibly generous passage, and it's near the end of the book. She says, when we hear a story, we know to look for ourselves in it. We recall our own fumbling, misfitting, parading of arrogance. I have done all those things, and it must be clear to the audience that it is this parade of arrogant and misfitting, tripping and fumbling that has conjured the myth I am telling. Then we must face ourselves and alter our conduct accordingly. As a writer, I must also write as though it is this misfitting, tripping, fumbling and parading that in the end has brought me my greatest joy because it revealed the journey to the good life. So here's talking about the task of the writer, but I think there's an analogy there, right? Um, we have, all have fumbling and misfitting and, you know, and parading of arrogance, right? Like we do it wrong. But if you're self-reflective and facing yourself, as she puts it, right, um, and trying to alter your conduct accordingly, you it, you get somewhere else. And the place you get is the good life. Again, this is a phrase she uses a number of times. And I remember, again, the first time I heard this phrase and read this phrase, I was like, what does that mean, right? It's it's so simple, right? It's monosyllabic, right? The good life, right? But what might that mean? You know, what might that mean? It doesn't just mean pleasure, right? It means something much more complicated than that. It means inhabiting your community, right? And getting things from it and giving to it. And then who is your community? Right? It's another way of asking the question, like, who are we? Right? Who is your community? Okay? I mean, that's, that's the kind of provocations that are in this book. I find that incredibly exciting. But it's a very generous view. Oh, absolutely. It's like, you know, yeah, you will fuck up, right? <laughs> You're yeah. not going to fuck yeah. up, right? But you, you try to progress. So I'm very much aware of the limitations of what we know, or I know, or what you know. But there's like seems like there's a path, right? And that's so provocative and it casts so much light on a lot of what we've been trying to do in this podcast. Well, speaking of which, <laughs> <laughs> we are we have more or less run out of time to talk about this book. I bet you will will think about it again though. I bet you anything will reflect on it at different moments. Oh, absolutely. It's a it's a good way to start the year. Thank you all for listening to this episode which is a little bit unusual for us. No, no, it's fine. You know what? We wanted it to be a standalone, right? We wanted it to do something different from the what, what the books do that are in clusters. Um, and so maybe it will set the tone for um, some of the more adventurous things we'll do this year. So speaking of adventure. Next time. <laughs> so our next cluster is going to be on revolutions. Yes. And we've got three books lined up for everybody. I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this cluster for ages. So the first book we're going to be looking at is by C.L.R. James. It's called The Black Jacobins, Toussaint Louverture, and the San Domingo Revolution. Which do you want to say a quick note about what that's about? Well, it's about the Haitian Revolution of 1781 to 1804, um, but it's also a really profound reflection on the nature of revolution and the ways in which it intersects with other kinds of social division. I think it's going to be a really incredible thing to talk about together. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, then we'll be reading a book that I've long wanted to get around to reading, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Yeah, from 1906, it was a really striking moment when a lot of different possibilities existed on American soil. So that'll be a really neat uh, moment to revisit. And finally, uh, breaking uh, some exciting new ground for us, we'll be looking at Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting about the Iranian Revolution. Yeah, and and we'll finally be doing a comic book. Yeah, that will be neat. So yeah, so this will be really exciting, and we will see how these books play off each other, hmm. and possibly how they play off memory serves. I'm really excited about the Revolutionary Cluster, though, I have to say. I think it's going to be really neat. It was so hard for us to choose what to include and not to include. Yes, it always is. But We could do like, we could do like three Revolution Clusters. I'd be totally happy. <laughs> Ah, oh, that'll be the spinoff podcast. Nothing but books about revolution. <laughs> so, in the meantime, if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter, and we'd always love to hear from you. 
Show notes with links for anything we've mentioned in this episode are at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 23, and the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Till next time, see you again at the Spouter Inn.